Um, I wanted to start, we've, we've been through an amazing series um, called Ruthless and uh, preaching through the book of Ruth. Uh, I think it's been such a timely series. Um, if you think about where we are in the world and the, the parallels are profound. Um, but uh, just to bring you up to speed, for those of you that haven't been with, with us for all of those, the story of Ruth is basically, it's a story of loss, a story of death, and a story of restoration. And um, the, if you follow the narrative of Ruth, she was just a, basically a friend, but also by relative, to Naomi. And she followed Naomi, and the story of her following Naomi actually led her to her redemption. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. I'm not going to take too much time on that. I do have a story I want to tell. And it is a, a personal story from our time in Cambodia. And um, it is quite drastic, so I'll... Disclosure, sorry. Um, it's, it's about a boy that we as a family had the privilege of getting to know. And, um, but he was introduced, or a friend of ours met him when he was 12 months old. And um, uh, just for those of you that don't know, the atrocities in Cambodia are still happening in some way, shape, and form, uh, but mostly through neglect. And it's the whole child space and uh, trafficking and all that is still a major problem. So the friend of ours had, um, I'm not going to name the boy, but um, the, she operated in, in the space of where she ran a, a ministry to brothels. Basically, she'd walk into brothels and offer brothel workers the opportunity to leave and pay them a salary from day one so that they wouldn't have to be looking for, for an alternative. So she, in the brothel, she met this 12-month-old baby who was living in the brothel. Um, and I'll spare you some of the details because it's horrific. Um, the pain and the torture that the 12-month-old had from being beaten to being thrown in a sewer, from being... He had no lips when she found him. because Not because they'd been removed, but because that was the level of his dehydration. So he had been so, so neglected that uh, his body was actually sapping its own moisture. So his lips, his, his head was distorted, um, also from dehydration. So, uh, and that's when she met him. Um, it came out over the course of years, the level of trauma that this poor boy had endured. And um, she decided to adopt him. So there is a good end to the story, so don't worry. And I'll just save you the details, but um, the kicker in the story that is, is her name is Ruth. And uh, she was in our, in our life group. Um, and we got to spend significant time and see this boy who literally should have died three times, see him restored. And now he's a star soccer player, and, and he lives in an international, he, he attends an international school. He's, he's like the most popular kid in the class because of the restoration that Ruth and a team of people have carried him through. She... By her story, um, she also had, had been redeemed. So knowing redemption positions, positions us well to be actively involved in the redemption story that Jesus ultimately leads us through. Thanks, my babe. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to do some reading. Um, thanks, sweet. Isn't she beautiful? Even with that ghetto mask you're wearing. <laughs> Can we just pray? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the stories that we all carry of redemption. And tonight, as we look at Redeemer, I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal what that means to us. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, speak to each one of us. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at Ruth 3 and the, just the kind of the section that happened before this game did such a good job last week in talking us through um, Ruth's role. And actually last week, I already knew I was preaching and when we sat in the meeting, um, I was praying, God, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And God just said to me, just look at what Boaz does. So that's what we're going to do today. And because we looked at what Ruth did and she was obedient she was expectant. What was the third one? Blank. 
Anyway, it was yours, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, she, she just listened to Naomi because she was, she was the foreigner. She didn't know the whole cultural you know, protocols, so she just obeyed. And anyway, so we're going to read from uh, chapter 3 and from verse 11 to the end of the chapter. Um, it should be up on the screen. Now, obviously, we're going after Redeemer today, so that's why it's, that's quite highlighted. It says, and now, my daughter, this is Boaz speaking, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a Redeemer. Yet there is a Redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he will not, sorry, but if he is not willing to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to me on the threshing floor. He said, bring me your garment that you're wearing. Hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest and will settle this matter today. All right, so we, I want to look at just a couple of things that he does, Boaz, and there's no hidden agenda here. We're going to get to Jesus. Boaz is the mirror picture of Jesus, and we are the mirror picture of Ruth. Um, so anyway, what, is he do, what he does, firstly, he restores herself. Now, this, is, this goes into it's her confidence. It's her peace. He says to her, do not fear. Now, in the Bible, when you hear do not fear, generally it's because there's a reason to fear. All right? So just context-wise, she is a Moabite. So there's the whole xenophobic thing, right? She is the outsider. She's, for lack of better terms, she's free game, especially in the field. So there's the, the xenophobia, but also in the, in the workplace for her, the only reason she was safe is because Boaz told the guys, hands off, right? And she should not work in another field. Now, if you spend any time in agriculture in third world countries, it's not a safe place especially if you're a single woman or a widow. So when he says to her, do not fear, there's obviously, she had fear, right? He settles her, and he says to her, I will do all that you ask. He honors her character. I found, it, I found it really fascinating. He says, all the townsmen, how would they know? Townsmen, right? It's, uh, the only explanation is people speaking about it, but I think he was speaking about it. He's, he's her redeemer, ultimately, but he's the one who's been talking about her. Um, he honors her character. He actually calls her, the term that he says, you woman of noble character, is the same term that's used in Proverbs 31. So if you read Proverbs 31, that's like the ideal woman, and um, I'll, I won't preach on that one, but um, I'll leave that for my wife. But the, that whole concept of she sits at the gate, she works, she, she brings honor to her husband. That's actually a prophetic thing that Boaz was saying to her. Because she would bring honor to Boaz. If you know Boaz's story, he is the descendant of Rahab. She was a prostitute, right? But his, when he says, you're a woman of noble character, you bring honor to me. There's a prophetic picture there because we know, I'm not going to, preach on chapter 4 today, but that's where that ends. Um, what else he does? He protects her dignity. Um, he says to her, stay here tonight. That's so that she doesn't have to travel alone. It's, to, it's a protection. But also, then he, he, he gives her grain. That's an alibi for the next day. So she has a reason for being in the, at the threshing floor. Because if she comes back from the city, he's like, where's she been? Um, so she's got an alibi. So he, rest, he literally goes into her whole person, herself, and he restores herself. 
her confidence, her character is, is highlighted. The second thing is security. Now, uh, food security has become a hot topic of late. It was always, if we're honest about history. In, in, if you look at the, the reason why they left uh, Bethlehem in the first place was because of a lack of food. All right, so he restores initially. It's quite interesting. He gives her six measures, right? Um, it's not a payout. In other words, she can't live on this for the rest of her life. Right? But it's enough for her to go back and to be taken care of until the metal settled, settled. Right? It's actually, he's keeping her as a dependent. But he's giving her enough so that she feels secure. Right? And enough for her and her mother-in-law. He also swears to her. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. That's, he's speaking to her internal security. Also, the, the, the whole exchange is very evident to Naomi, because when Naomi, when Naomi hears and sees the, the grain, she says, wait, this, this is going to be settled. So there's a cultural indication through what happened to Naomi that she knows it's a done deal, right? So um, the, the third thing in terms of security, we've got to acknowledge the fact that Boaz was a worthy redeemer. He's not some average dude going, yeah, I'll take care of you, right? and she's like, uh, I don't know, right, and um, anyway, I'm not going to go into all those, there's a whole lot of things I could say about that, but he is actually capable, he's the honorable man in the story, so he, firstly, as I said, he restores, his, he restores his self, then her security, and lastly, he restores her status. Now, there's two things that are worth mentioning here. Um, in Hebrew custom and some parts of the law, there were two concepts that actually Boaz takes on. One is the goal, which is to restore the land. So if land, the, I mean, it's, you just look at what's happening at the moment, it's still about the land, right? But uh, the, the Hebrews were very jealous or pr protective over their land. So if land was lost, it would be up to the tribe or to the, the fellow kinsmen to redeem the land. So if somebody got into debt and they had to sell their land, the first people that would come to the rescue would be because they want to keep it in the village. They want to keep it in the tribe. So that's goal. It's, the romanization is that G-O-E-L, but it's, it's actually a Hebrew concept. Um, and the second one is Leverite marriage, which this is when you're... If, uh, a woman's husband died, the brother, not obligated, but he would be encouraged to marry her, and then they would take care of the lineage. His name would live on. So it's two things. It's land and it's name, all right? And in, in this, he actually takes on both, right? He's like, okay, I will marry you, and I'll buy the land. Boaz goes after the lady, not the land. Now, in this story, um, I'm just going to flip over to chapter 4. Just one thing here. There was, Boaz mentioned, there was one closer. There was a, a nearer one. Um, now, Hebrew scholars tell us that that's actually Elimelech's brother. Um, it's, it's not in this, but it's in their, in their writings. Um, so, and then, by order of that, Boaz is actually Elimelech's nephew. Elimelech was Naomi's husband that died. So that's the, the lineup. But so he gets the offer. Boaz goes and says to him, okay, so you're closer. You should redeem her first. And he says, great, when he's offered the land. No thanks when he's offered the lady. So it's, it basically Boaz sets him up and says, if you redeem this land, yes, I want the land. And then says, okay, but if you redeem the land, you redeem Ruth. And he's like, I'm out. So he wanted the land, not the lady. Boaz wanted the lady got the land. So with that, obviously, it was huge significance that she now, her place was restored, her field, and her line. That is, for, for, for Hebrew, that was the, where they got all their status. Who's, I mean, who's your daddy? You just look at the lineage in Matthew. That's because it's such a big thing for, for, Israel, for Jewish people. 
they follow the, 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 the family line, and, but also place. So he, restu- he restores both of the most significant things to her. Now, let's go to Jesus. I think that's where I want to go. Um, this is evidently mirrored in the way Jesus restores us. So again, I said self, security, and status. So we're going to look at those three and how Jesus does it. Just to, to talk about self, uh, of late it's become quite a thing of, I want to be a better version of myself. I hear people saying that. Great sentiment. Or very often it's like, well, I'm not allowed to be myself in the negative, right? That's the, I don't want to, you know, I can't be myself. Can I be honest? I don't want to be myself. I want to be like Jesus. Because that is the best version of myself. And obviously personality, yes, I need to be myself. But obedience, I don't get to make those choices of what I feel comfortable obeying. That, by definition, obedience, it's, it's subjective. It's not subjective. I don't know, okay, today I feel like, no, if I'm obedient, I'm obedient. So just to back that up, in, in first, first Corinthians 6, we don't have to read it, but it says you are a temple bought with the price. You are not your own. Right? We are redeemed. We have been bought back. We love the concept of redemption. In other words, we don't have a debt. Okay? We don't have a debt, but we have a Lord. Right? And people don't like to hear that. It's got really quiet in the room. But that's what we need to go after because my story of obedience has led me to a full life. It is best practice. Redemption without obedience, I don't know what that is. Anyway, I get fired up about that anyway. (laughs) All right, so the best version of yourself is being led and being led by the Holy Spirit. The issue of fear as well. We have a Prince of Peace. In terms of us restoring ourselves, He comes into the room and says, you have nothing to fear. I operated uh, for many years as a counselor uh, in Cambodia. Anxiety is part of the deal. Uh, There's lots of PTSD, lots of all of that stuff, and with that comes anxiety. Most of it is an anticipation of punishment. What does Jesus say? Fear is the anticipation of punishment, but perfect love drives out fear. So when we look at redemption, we've got to look at love, because love chases fear out the room. Right? And it's all about trust, really. Because if I know he's got my back, I can obey. He restores ourselves so that we can be ministered to. The, the whole concept of a priesthood of believers is that we are ministered to. Priests were ministered to by God. But then they, sorry, let's have a look. Two hands. Um, <laughs> they were ministered to by God, but then they're also ministered to the people. So our redemption brings us into a story where we can actually be part of the solution. We can actually, through our testimony, through our pain, we get, sorry, through our pain, we get testimony. So we can, hey, I've been through something like that. Let me just give you a hand. Here's a handle. Here's something that may help you. My, my purpose is to help you because I've been redeemed. All right, so our self gets taken care of. Our security, Jesus said this, birds of the air. When we talk about food, all right, the Father feeds them. Are you not of more value? I will never leave you or forsake you. What kind of security is that? We live in a world that sells us security, and it's just a veneer. It's just a, an appearance of things are cool. But when we have that, I'll never leave you. We also have, in terms of security, we have, in, I don't have time to read it, but in John 14, Jesus says, I'm going to the Father, and I will give you another that another is, is the Greek alos, which means an exact copy of myself permanently with you forever. So when we say, when Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, and then he goes to heaven, you're like, what happened? 
No, he left the Holy Spirit as our access. We have access to him 24-7. That is security for me. Because when I'm, I'm in the, in the dwang, I've got, to, I've got to call someone. I'm not going to call Ghostbusters. They don't help. All right? And uh, I'll spare you the details, but in, we had a couple of <laughs> scenarios in Cambodia. Ghostbusters were an option. But anyway. <laughs> I mentioned that Boaz was worthy. How much more, Jesus? When he redeems, he does it for good. It's not a temporary redemption that ends in divorce. It's not a moment that ends in disappointment. He redeems us eternally. And now. The promises that he gives us are for eternity, but not only for one day when we go to heaven. We have access to him now. Lastly, our status. What does he do with our status? He gives us the right to be children. That's what it says in John. Everyone that's received him, he gives them the right to be children of God. And that's access. In Hebrews it says we can approach the throne of grace with boldness. That's because we have one who understands us. He calls us friends. And in Ephesians 2, I mentioned it before, he created us before the foundation of the world for works of service. He gives us a purpose. That's for me, it's the, the question most people are asking, what is life about? What am I supposed to do? Well, that for me, is, it's, that's a status thing. I get to do something meaningful with my life with my years, with my days. When we're looking at redemption, what does a kingsman redeemer do? The last thing that Jesus did on the cross, the last thing Jesus said on the cross was a term tetelestai, which is an economic term that was used in the day when said the deal's done. It was also used by Greek, sorry, by Hebrew scholars, when they, when they did the, sorry, priests, when they did the whole sacrifice, blood here, blood there, everything's done. When they were finished, they would say, it's, it's the equivalent of Tetelestai, the sacrifice was sufficient for today, right? But Jesus on the cross says this, he, the Hebrew, the Jewish people listening would have known sacrifice finished, the dealers would have known deal done, it's been paid in full. Our debt has canceled. Now, earlier I said Boaz was not required. The Lord did not require him to redeem Ruth. That's why the other guy, the guy that was nearer, said no. He didn't have to. The Lord did not require. But the Lord did require payment for our sin. And Jesus fulfilled that law. The nearer, the guy that is nearer to us, do we, do we take the easy road sometimes? What I mean is, Boaz, he, he wasn't the first in line, right? We had, as I mentioned, I think it's Elimelech's brother, who was first in line, but he didn't actually want her, he just wanted the land, right? How many of us, is it easier for us to take a tactile, physical substitute for our true redeemer something closer right substance a less than worthy partner a job I don't know what do we do to take that makes us feel like we're redeemed but we know it's not eternal I was really blessed by this next thing. If you go to the next slide, thanks. Psalm 23, I think we all know it. I don't know if you can read that. But my three points, if you remember, he restores myself, he restores my security, he restores my status. That's in Psalm 23. Right? If you can't read it, I'll read it to you. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's myself. 
I will, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare my table before me. He restores our security. You anoint me, and I dwell in your house forever. That's my status as a son. I get to live with the Father. He restores us completely. He is the Redeemer. He is our kinsman Redeemer. He has become our kinsman. We are his brothers and sisters. 